three, two. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of another Dolphins podcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. There is plenty, plenty, plenty to get to on today's show. I think the Dolphins have signed close to 10 free agents at this point, and I cannot talk about that many players alone. Joshua Howitz, Merrick Brave. Happy Wednesday, gentlemen. Happy Wednesday to you, Jake. Happy Wednesday, Josh. Uh, you know, depending on what side of the fence you're sitting on, it, it's either happy or, or not happy. Are, are we happy with the Dolphins' additions? Are we still sad about the, the big-name players that they've lost? You know, I log on to Twitter, and it's 50-50 right now. I, I love Greer. I hate Greer. So, I don't know. I guess we'll we'll provide the voice of sanity or insanity, depending on your stance. Um, and we'll give the people what they want or what they don't want. I'm not sure, but thanks for tuning in, everybody. Josh, how are you feeling today? Yeah, I mean, I'm not even sure I know if I'm happy or sad with the way this uh, free agency has gone, but um, I'm thankful that I get to come on here and talk Dolphins football and, you know, people come on here and listen to us. So, um, yeah, happy New Year, guys, and um, let's hope this year ends differently than the last few years had. Am I right? Well, sounds like we got some undecision here. And, Josh, our goal by the end of this podcast is to make you decide if you should be happy or sad with the Dolphins and what they've done the first couple days of free agency. Plenty of, plenty of names to get through. A couple days ago, Josh and I said a fan-focused goodbye to Christian Wilkins, Jerome Baker, all the guys who uh, were foundations to this team for years. So if you have not listened to that, go back and check that out. But today is all about the free agents the Miami Dolphins have been signing. And gentlemen, Let's start with the offense. The Dolphins haven't added a lot of offensive free agents, but one that started quite a stir on Dolphins Twitter, Aaron Brewer, a three-year, $21 million contract. Merrick, what can you tell me about the former Titans starting offensive lineman? Well, you know, I can't claim to be an expert on on the Tennessee Titans and, and their players. But, you know, looking into this Aaron Brewer signing, and I, I got to tell you, I'm a fan. I, I like what I've seen so far. A um, little bit better of a run defender than a, a pass protector, um, as I've learned. You know, not, he recovers well on, on some of his pass protection stuff. But you have to wonder, you know, how... How many of those issues stem from the fact that he was playing with quarterbacks who like to hold on to the ball uh, for a good amount of time? We all remember the Ryan Tannehill era here in Miami. I think we all remember he wasn't the best in the pocket at evading pressure and evading sacks. Uh, and then you, you take a look at the other quarterbacks that Brewer has played with, and they've been rookies. You know, uh, Will Levis this past year, rookies don't process as quickly as veterans. So, You never know when it comes to that. But as far as his run blocking goes, you have to be impressed with his mobility, his movement skills, his ability to get on the second level and and eat up linebackers and redirect those guys, especially when the Dolphins have an offense with speedy guys like Raheem Mostert, Devon Achan, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, like screens to these guys and Brewer hitting those linebackers on the second level. That could lead to some uh, some some long Miami Dolphins touchdowns, which I think I can speak for all of us when I say uh, we like those. We like those around here. Those are always nice to see. So Aaron Brewer, uh, I'm going to give this signing a thumbs up, boys. What say you, Josh? Yeah, I mean, if we're going thumbs up or thumbs down, I'm all for this. I mean, you mentioned not being a uh, expert of the Tennessee Titans. I'm not an expert of the offensive line by any stretch of the imagination. We know how important it is to be vocal and to be able to communicate up there um, at center. And it seems like, uh, you know, based on the film, based on people that, you know, um, I guess maybe under- are more focused on the offensive line than maybe I am, think that this guy is in a great fit for what Miami does, right? You mentioned the speed, him being able to get out there, his mobility. Um, and it just goes to the uncertainty surrounding Connor Williams. Um, you mentioned some of his, uh, I guess, he did give up uh, the second most sacks last year in 2023. I've written down, I think, five penalties, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, again, no one knew what was going to happen with Connor Williams. You had to go out there and get a center. It goes back to what Chris Greer does best, and that's kind of fill these holes heading into the draft. So now you know we're all sitting there looking at Powers Johnson. Maybe they still go that way, moving the guard for a little bit, whatever it might be. But, you know, right now as it sits, the Dolphins don't need a center. And coming into this uh, offseason, that was one of those big, huge holes on the Dolphins' offensive line. So I'm stoked for this. I'll give it a thumbs up, but I'm not going to sit here and pretend I know um, a lot about Aaron Brewer. 
See, Merrick, you started the show by saying we're either going to be on the good side or the bad side. We're not going to be literally sitting on the fence, but I think that's the situation the Dolphins, due to their salary cap issues, they are uncomfortably sitting on that fence because all of these signings, there's some really interesting, compelling arguments to be made, but my God, I am horrified. He had the second most sacks among all centers last year. He was on the worst offensive line of all of football. Merrick, how tall is Connor Williams? Um, four foot 11, six, five, very close. Oh, close. Okay. Aaron Brewer is six, one. I can see eye to eye to him. <laughs> and so we think about what the dolphins are doing here. They are completely shrinking at the center position. I tried to look for someone close. Tyler Lindenbaum is six, two, but I actually struggled to find identify centers that were that short. We understand it, right? This is where we can start to get into the positives. Well, Mike McDaniel's offense, some of the greatest highlights of being a Dolphins fan the last two years are when you have those guards, those interior linemen, just down, downfield eating linebackers, shoving them into the third level, the fourth level, whatever it may be. That's where I think Brewer could be an interesting, compelling argument. And two, we've said it enough times, there are salary cap issues, there are draft issues, where this Dolphins team needs to take some chances and have some projects. If we want to kind of look at how the Dolphins are, are building, you have a coach. And what's that coach's superpower is offense. Well, we can't cut corners on offense. You're about to make two of the highest paid, one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the league. And you have one of the highest paid wide receivers in the league. Well, maybe one of those Mike McDaniel benefits is that he can nail these uh, traits that make the centers perfect for his scheme. That's kind of my hope here. That's kind of what you're leaning into is the idea that okay, Mike McDaniel knows these guys. And if it isn't that, hey, you can make it work with a mid-tier um, uh, wide receiver group. Maybe if you want those guys and utilize them in the best way possible, this is somewhere the Dolphins can cut corners. So it is a scary uh, you know, deal. It isn't someone who can go in and say this is a surefire, locked-in player who's going to be a home run for the Dolphins. But I think I'm willing to hang up and listen and give McDaniel the benefit of the doubt based on you know moving guys along the offensive line. It seemed to work pretty well for the Dolphins. You know, you, you touch on the height thing. Six foot one seems relatively short for an interior offensive lineman, but I feel like that's where you actually kind of want some shorter offensive linemen is on the interior. Your tackles, you want them to be big mammoths, but, you know, tinfoil hat here. L let's get the tinfoil hat on. Tua Tungavailoa is not a tall quarterback. He needs to be able to see over his offensive lineman. So if you take four inches off of your center and now he's the same height as Tua Tungavailoa, Maybe that allows Tua to be able to see the middle of the field a little bit better. And where does Tua love throwing the football? The middle of the field. So my tinfoil hat, my spin zone is working overtime like right it. now. And, uh, and y you know, when you're shorter, you have a lower center of gravity. And when you have a lower center of gravity, you're able to control your opponent and move him where you'd like him to go. So uh, that was the, the the full spin zone on, on the Aaron Brewer uh height or lack thereof. Um, and, you know, again, we'll see how it all plays out. But the thing about offensive line and the Miami Dolphins is they, Tua doesn't hold on to the ball for a long time. So he makes kind of everybody look a little bit better than they actually are. You know sure. what I mean? Like he gets the ball out quickly. He doesn't take a lot of sacks. So I expect those sack numbers to go down if Aaron Brewer is indeed the starting center for the Miami Dolphins next year, which all indications are that they signed him to play center, not to play guard. Um, so I think Tua and Mike McDaniel and the scheme will be able to mask some of those pass blocking inefficiencies. And hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, to maximize his run blocking efforts because uh, that's where he really excels, according to people in the know. Yeah, this is when uh, being a gentleman and going last backfires because I was looking around trying to find a tinfoil hat because that's exactly what I thought of when he said six foot one. So someone can rewind and go back, throw the challenge flag, but you see me looking around for that foil because I was going to say the same thing. That Maybe that's so Tua can now see better <laughs> over the middle of the field and just carve it up even more. But one thing I don't know that we mentioned is his versatility. He played guard most of his career with the Titans, so um, he is now a newer center. And, you know, um, Connor Williams played what? Was it two years at center, I guess? Was it, was he with Miami for two years? He was, right? Yeah. Was it two seasons? Yeah, so now this guy's only had one year under his belt. So, um, like Jake said, it's no sure. Who knows? Maybe they keep Connor Williams on speed dial, and as the uh, season progresses and all season progresses and we start to get some of that money, uh, maybe they call him up and he goes back to playing that guard where he was pretty damn good before.
Dude, I was laughing so hard because as this uh, information breaks, everybody wants to be the first person to talk about it. And, you know, the first person who responded to the Dolphins signing Aaron Brewer, they you could tell they went on ESPN and they just looked at 2023 and like, great, the Dolphins signed a true center. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. Actually, this guy has been a left guard for the majority of his career. And two, I'm not saying that any of this stuff is is bad, but I think it's just kind of interesting that the Dolphins are going in such this unique direction. But that's kind of what you want in offenses, right? You can only chase the blueprint for so long. Eventually, you got to be in front of it and, and ahead of the curve. So we will see with someone like Aaron Brewer. Let's flip the coin. Let's talk defense. Guys, do you want to go Jordan Brooks or do you want to go Anthony Walker? Who are you feeling? Who are you more jazzed up about? We did forget Sal Nachman. I'm just throwing it out there. We re-signed Sal oh, Nachman. We'll we don't, we're not to talk. You said offense, so we were talking offense, but okay, I'm sorry. You I know what? You know, what? let's talk Sal Von Uh I did hear Joshua Houts, and, and we'll bounce it right back to you. Some people are genuinely upset that Salvin Salvan Ahmed is coming back as that fourth running back on this Miami Dolphins roster. Fifth, if you want to say he's battling with Chris Brooks. That means this entire running back group will be back. Does it stay that way? Does Miami maintain this group, or is there going to be a change coming? Sorry for that epic voice crack. It was beautiful. Were you asking me or were you asking Mary? Because before we came on here, man, we're already seeing rumors about J.K. Dobbins, and I'm sitting here thinking, okay, we don't need we a did. running back. But pause, pause. I've... We are. We're seeing J.K. Wait, Dobbins rumors. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, are yeah, you? we are. I, that, that was something we saw on Twitter. That's right before I came on. It said Dolphins. And I believe another team had interest in J.K. Dobbins and my heart dropped because, you know, I find these man crushes. I become fans of these players in the draft and um, I'll always want J.K. Dobbins on my team. So um, just throwing that out there. I don't know. It was ML football. So they took it from NFL Network. So um, take that with a grain of salt. But yeah. Salvin Ahmed coming back, the first thing I thought is Jeff Wilson's making $3 million next season. I mean, if you're going to have Salvin Ahmed on the roster for what? I didn't see the contract yet. I'm going to assume. Two. Okay, I was going to say a league minimum. That would have been rude. But you know what I mean? I think I might rather have Salvin Ahmed, have him in that passing game, like you mentioned in a previous pod, Jake, you know, about how get, getting those running backs more involved. He had caught 16 to 23 targets for 88 yards and a touchdown. We all remember that little arrow route that he ran that was just perfectly timed. So um, I don't have any – I'm not mad about this. I don't think it's going to stop the Dolphins from going out there and maybe drafting a running back if they fall to him, you know, bringing in an undrafted acorn or even signing a guy like J.K. Dobbins, who I think has some South Florida ties, wants to go out there and have a prove it deal so um i have no issues with salvin ahmed i will sit here and say no disrespect to jeff wilson but if it were up to me i would you know cut ties with him it's gonna save you nearly three million dollars because um let's be honest i'm gonna sit here and say it but chris brook might be every bit as thunderish as uh jeff wilson i had to throw that out there because i think even mina kimes is now talking about thunderish and lightning and things like that so um, you know, uh, I, I just don't really care about Savon Ahmed. If I'm being honest, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and, and going to start a game at least next year. You watch, we'll you know, see, happens I, every I, year. you know, he feels like a trail body. Sure. 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 He feels like H and insurance. I think, uh, Ahmed has had his fair share of injuries as well. He's a smaller type guy, but you know, I just, I feel like at, at that salary, 1.2 mil, he's certainly not a lock to make the roster. You're free to do whatever you want in the running back room, whether that's bringing in another free agent, you know, you're talking about JK Dobbins there. We know how much Chris Greer loves his dented cans and JK Dobbins certainly fits into that mold might be one of the most dented cans out there right now. So uh, I could totally see it happening, but you know, if Savon Ackman makes the team, he's not going to be a starting running back. He'll be a change of pace guy and uh, injury insurance for, for the other guys there. Um, I guess it does help that, that he knows the scheme. Uh, it, it's an intricate scheme and they, you know, we're entering year three of it here and Ahmed's been here for all three years. So, or all two years and going into a third year. So that's my spin zone on that one. I, I give it a positive grade there and I'm glad we're not overpaying. Merrick, would you say that this is the group going into 2024? Is someone else being added? No, I, I think they'll add another body, you know, whether that's a, an undrafted rookie or a, a dented can like JK Dobbins, like we talked about, you know, it's totally possible, but uh, I, I don't think this is the group. And I do kind of agree with Josh that Jeff Wilson, it, as much as I like him, I do think he's expendable at the $3 million price tag. Um, and I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be sad if they wanted to, to, you know, lift some, kick over some rocks and, and, and see if they could find, find somebody else to take a spot you know, see if somebody else could inject some life into the running game.
And the Dolphins have been sniffing around just about every available running back for the last two years, too, people forget. So, I mean, keep that in mind. I was a little bummed to see that Aaron Jones, after his release from the Packers, signed with the Vikings, I think, on a one-year, $7 million deal. That would have been one player I would have absolutely loved to see in Miami. The Dolphins have a group of running backs who can catch the football, but I don't think it's a strength of any of them. Yes, Raheem Mostert, if you look at that Denver game, caught seven of his uh, all seven of his targets monster day but some of the times on the swing routes it looks a little uncomfortable a little clunky at times i wonder if mcdaniel's still looking for that perfect guy there all right josh you avoided the question the first time uh which linebacker are you more excited about we have jordan brooks coming in from the seahawks and anthony walker former member of the cleveland browns that's not even close right jordan brooks all day right i'm, I'm pretty stoked for that i mean i i um Admittedly, I've only started watching the tape now, but I mean, this player looks like almost a slight upgrade over Jerome Baker. I mean, he's 26 years old, uh, appeared in 63 games, 309 tackles, six and a half sacks. I mean, um, I think he's better in coverage than what we've seen out of our linebackers in years past. I know a lot of people label him as a run stuffer. And when you look at the uh, contract, he got, what, three years up to $30 million. So um, linebacker is one of the positions I enjoy watching most. And so far, what I've seen out of Jordan Brooks, um, I absolutely love. So um, him next to David Long and I believe Joe Barry catching that unit. Uh, coaching that unit. I'm catching that unit. I, I'm kind of intrigued and excited to see what that middle of that Dolphins defense looks like because we come on here all the time and we joke about how the days of Carlos Dansby, you know, and Kevin Barnett, the days of those pass. And um, it seems like slowly but surely we're getting back there. So um, I'm stoked for this Jordan Brooks signing. I believe he does have some injury concerns that maybe, you know, that's something we got to um, pray that doesn't Denny can type thing. But I'm stoked for this one. I think this is going to be a good signing and really going to change the interior of that Dolphins defense. Injury concerns, he fits right in. Welcome to Miami. We have a, a crowded uh, trainer's room, but uh, we'll find a spot for you, Jordan Brooks. No, I like that you touched on the uh, the pass coverage skills there because as soon as the Dolphins signed Jordan Brooks, uh, somebody from Pro Football Focus, Ryan Smith possibly, you know, I'll call you out, Ryan. I'll call you out. You, you got something to say? Come find me on these Twitter streets, Ryan. Now I hope it was Ryan because I, if I'm just calling him out for no reason, then uh, I feel bad. But anyways, as soon as the Dolphins sign Jordan Brooks, Ryan Smith talks about how uh, he's a liability in coverage. And then multiple people on Twitter posted screenshots of PFF's own website that says Jordan Brooks is one of the best coverage linebackers or was one of the best coverage linebackers in the National Football League last season. So, so which one is it, PFF? Is he a terrible in coverage uh, just because he signed with the Miami Dolphins or is he good in coverage, which you rated him that way for an entire season? So I, I want to know, PFF. But much like yourself, Josh, I am a fan of this signing. Three years, $30 million. Um, you know, that, that's a pretty solid deal for, for a young former first round pick, um, big guy, jacked guy, a little bit of a thumper, uh, should, should add a, an alpha dog mentality to this. Where's a visor. Where's a visor. Sorry. Uh, to now, interrupt, but I have to now, we, now we know why you like him, Josh. You should have just said visor. That should have been your entire analysis. And we would have understood why you were a fan of the signing, but, uh, you know, he comes from Seattle, Seattle, uh, historically knows their defenders and they took this guy in the first round. So um, we'll see what he does down here in Miami. He's taken over. It sounds like he's taken over the Jerome Baker role and he's going to be paired up with David Long, uh, who is another linebacker who the Dolphins added last year, who had some questions going into the season and he turned out a stellar year for the Miami Dolphins. So let's hope Jordan Brooks can follow in those footsteps and we can, uh, have a, a completely remade linebacking core here and, and it can pay dividends for the Dolphins. You know, the first thing Dolphins Twitter is going to do, they see former first round pick going to fall head over heels for someone like that. Uh, so Jordan Brooks last year, he had four games without a missed tackle. So 25% of the time he didn't have a missed tackle. Uh, he had seven games with at least two missed tackles. Jerome Baker, he had two games with two missed tackles. So that's almost four times more games where he had... Double or uh, multiple missed tackles. This is what we talk about when we say that maybe the Dolphins are going to have to kind of step back, take some chances, rely on scheme. Because looking at the stats, Trone Baker was so damn consistent for this defense. I don't necessarily know I can like confidently like pull the trigger and say right away, yes, Jordan Brooks is this clear upgrade. 
I don't like that PFF argument because neither side or neither opinion that was just shared there mentioned any type of context whatsoever. So I'm going to just go ahead and provide it here. Uh, targeting Jordan Brooks in coverage, 84% of the passes were completed by opposing quarterbacks for an average of 9.4 yards per reception, 526 total yards. He didn't allow a single touchdown. He had one interception. Keep in mind here that is playing an entire season got to compare them to some, right? So let's look at Jerome Baker. Opposing quarterbacks completed 88% of passes when targeting Baker in coverage, which is a little more often than when targeting Brooks. Uh, Baker also missed four games, I believe it ended up being, because of that injury he suffered against the Commandos. Uh, But he allowed 340. Commandos, I love it. 54 yards in uh, coverage, two touchdowns allowed in coverage, and he did have two interceptions himself. That sounds reasonably comparable. Yes, you can kind of point at the no touchdowns allowed for Jordan Brooks and no touchdowns is a big deal. But I think these guys are are pretty similar in terms of just like the foundation of what they add to this defense. Uh, Their strength is probably going to be as that guy in the middle of the field that, hey, he might give up some receptions, but you're not going to see him in a situation where he's just kind of trucking 10 feet behind some guy uh, who's running down the field for a big play interesting signing could be a playmaker but yeah you see the couple warts there's the in- injury issues those missed tackles are a little spooky to me but again even those you could bring up for something along like maybe the ski maybe how he was told to attack as a defender those things are all in play here but uh, a lot of interesting kind of takes that are, are developing about how the dolphins are rebuilding and looking at this defense now that you don't have a defensive tackle and they're playing you know 130 percent of the snaps yeah, remember the quality of competition that Jordan Brooks was going uh, against in that division, you know? Like, if, if if he's asked to to play coverage with somebody like a George Kittle, that's going to be a tough ask, you know what I mean? If he's asked to play in the slot against somebody like a Cooper Cup, that's going to be a tough ask. So um, the fact that, that he was slightly better in coverage than Jerome Baker, um, cool. That's awesome. Slight upgrade there. We'll take it. Um, I do like that he's a little bit younger. And I like that he's got that first round pedigree. So we'll see. That's the thing. We're breaking down these these signings months before they're going to play uh, for the Miami Dolphins. But, you know, it's what we do. That is, we're obsessed with football. What are we going to do? Not talk about this stuff? So, yeah, Jordan Brooks, you get a thumbs up from me here. I'm wondering if I got a thumbs down for anyone yet. We'll see. No. And after, after Jake and I came on here, we're kind of doom and gloom a few days ago. I think it's okay to sit here and kind of gas up some of these guys. Um, we do have to mention, or at least it's something that came to mind is uh, Mike McDaniel was in San Francisco. He's, he, you know, game plan against Jordan Brooks. So tie that into, I'm sure Anthony Weaver's scheme, wanting to get his own guys in there. Um, we'll see if this is that true upgrade over Jerome Baker, but on paper, whether it's the years um, or his age, I should say, you know, slight better in coverage. Um, You know, even the contract, I'm sure the Dolphins have a way to, you know, finagle this thing. So um, I'm definitely intrigued by this, and I'm definitely more excited about that signing than the one we're going to talk about next, which is Anthony Walker, which wasn't he like the first dude they signed, I think, or am I mistaken? No, I'm I'm fairly confident you're right, Josh, that he is the first guy they signed in free agency. And so he suffered a knee injury at the end of the year. Uh, He would have, I think the injury he suffered near the end of December, early January. So he missed the playoff game. Uh, but he would have been back in February. So all signs say that he is going to be ready for the Dolphins, the the fun mini camps, training camps, whatever it may be. Uh, this might be the most interesting signing the Dolphins have made. Uh, he wore the blue dot in Cleveland's defense. He was viewed as a leader of that defense. He was calling plays in the huddle. This is a proven leader who was on a defense that some were saying was the best unit in all of football last year. So while, you know, Jordan Brooks is going to come in and be that established vet, we saw the issues that the Dolphins had at linebacker and the importance of having depth, having someone in there like an Anthony Walker one-year deal. Obviously, there's a situation here where he isn't even a starter, uh, but just kind of seeing where he came from and seeing this as like those prove it opportunities the Dolphins are going to have to rely on. This is setting up a situation that I kind of see like a Brent Grimes was in 2013, where he wasn't the first signing. The Dolphins signed five other guys first, but I mean, technically Anthony Walker was their first signing, but the point is he isn't the headline news where I think he could really carve out a role where we're talking about him in weeks 13, 14 as being just a consistent sound player on the second level of this defense. 
Yeah, uh, and I think you're right there, Jake. I don't think he's he was signed to be a starter. I think he's going to be your third linebacker at best. Could possibly even be your fourth linebacker, um, depending on where Duke Riley is uh, with his roster status by the time the season starts. You know, he's a two-down guy, uh, captain, former captain of the Cleveland Browns, which is kind of cool, uh, and also plays some special teams. So he could be uh, he could be a guy that the Dolphins look at for his special teams prowess there, and, and maybe he helps elevate a unit that. That could badly use some elevating. I think we kind of are all in agreement on that. Yeah, you can never have too many bodies in the middle of that Dolphins defense at linebacker. So, um, Jake, you got me hyped on a little bit. And the fact that, again, he was their first signing, I go back to, I don't know if it's a good comparison, but it wasn't Cedric Wilson. I think Mike McDaniel's like first ever signing. So um, let's see what Anthony Walker can do to this defense. Again, he's not going to be asked to start, but just being that depth piece, I mean, I didn't realize you wore the blue dot. That's a game changer for sure. What, 75 starts out of 85 games? I think you might have wrote that article, Jake. I can't keep up. So I, what does this mean for Channing Tindall, boys? Oh, that's a steep We don't talk deal. about that. <laughs> Let's go push him, motivate him. That's what it's going to do. It, it, that's Push it him off the roster. Weirdly enough, I mean, he's going to have the opportunities. It goes back to like the uh, – Noah Ibanagni, uh master plan for playing time we had a few years ago, Josh, and he was walking the walk. Like, he, he had that interception against Pittsburgh where it was like, this is it. Iggy made his play. He had his moment. Um, Tyndall's going to have to do that, and it's not going to be in week three. It's not going to be week four. He's going to be put into a t- tough situation. Like, his one chance might be like what Liam Eikenberg had to do in Philadelphia. Hey, come in and be the center for us. Something like that because all these signings – I tried not to get super homerish, and I'm not coming in and saying Anthony Walker Jr. is going to be the next Zach Thomas, but I'm genuinely excited to see how this story develops for someone like him. And part of that is because I think he could be a, a really effective depth piece. And part of the reason he has that opportunity is because Channing Tindall's MIA. We're photoshopping him on Zach Thomas for the image. <laughs> I t- I'm down. Let, let's let's make it happen. Maybe the most interesting story for the Dolphins so far is Jordan Poyer is headed to South Florida. That is super exciting. Former Pro Bowler, but then you realize it's a two million dollar deal. That's it. That's all it took to sign Jordan Poyer. And then you hear him saying he's super excited to come back to Miami to compete for a starting job. So. While the Dolphins did add Jordan Poyer, an exciting, exciting signing, I think they might not be done here. No, certainly not. And it it would be um, it wouldn't be the smartest idea for the Dolphins to to go all in and hang their hat on a 33 year old safety, which is what Jordan Poyer is going to be at the end of April. So the end did of they next go month. In at all? Let me ask you because it's a well, two that, they literally exactly. Go? But that's that's the point I'm trying to make is that it wouldn't have been smart for them to go all in, but at $2 million, sign me up all day, every day. Former first team all pro safety, uh, former Pro Bowl safety, flirted with the Dolphins last offseason. I think we all thought a deal was going to get done there. Instead, signs a two-year, $12 million deal to return to the Buffalo Bills with $7 million guaranteed. He lasts just one year there. Um, I had somebody actually wrote an article about Jordan Poirier signing for the Finsider yesterday, and I had a Bills fan hop in there, and he was laughing and saying, oh, well, yeah, just don't ask him to cover anyone. So I hopped on PFF, and Jordan Poirier actually had a 74.4 pass coverage grade, which uh, gives it that little green square there, which uh, makes that actually a pretty good pass coverage grade for Jordan Poirier. And then he's like, oh, yeah, well, he, uh, he allowed, I think, like, 26 of or 24 of 36 uh, passes to be completed. So he's terrible. And I said, well, actually that was the second best reception percentage uh, that he's had in his seven year bills career. Uh, The only year that was better than that was his all pro year. So if you think Jordan Poyer's seven year career in Buffalo was a good one last year was a pretty typical year for Jordan Poyer at safety for the Buffalo Bills, and now he is coming down to Miami and he's going to play safety for this Dolphins defense at a pretty cheap rate. Uh, his his lady, uh, Rachel Bush, very good-looking woman. Uh, excuse me, let me gather myself. She was excited that you know he gets to play in warm weather, which is good for them old bones, those 33-year-old bones. 
and uh, gets to play on natural grass instead of the turf field in Buffalo. So I'm excited for this Jordan Poyer signing and was even more excited when I saw it was only going to cost the team two million bucks. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, I guess it goes back to how, you know, they do these surveys and things and you hear how these players want to come down to Miami and Jake was, I, I sniped Jake. See, it happens all the time when there's three of us, the menage a trois, but you know, he wanted to come down there and Mike McDaniel wanted him down there. There was some flirting going on. So, um, you know, him coming saying he needs to come down here and compete. I think that might just be, you know, lip service. I think if he's half the Jordan Porter that we expect him or He's 33 years old, right? Let's get that out of the way. I even wrote down, is he washed, question mark. But 67 tackles last year, one forced fumble, forced pass breakups. Again, $2 million for one season, um, and he loves Mike McDaniel. So I'm intrigued by this signing. He seems like he's ready to come down. I think even some coming home, um, he's ready to go. And um, I do think, like you both said, though, this doesn't stop the Dolphins from signing a safety. I know we talked about Deshaun Elliott before we even came into the free uh, – before free agency even started. So I'd still call up to Sean Elliott and see what he wants. You know, there's tons of nice safeties out there still. So um, pairing Jordan Poyer with uh, Javon Hollins, sign me up. Cause you know, a year ago we were all gushing, drooling at the mouth, hoping it would happen. Poyer allowed more than 15 yak yards just once last year, um, 33 yards in week 10 and uh, against Denver. So he was carved up by uh, Russell Wilson. Outside of that, he was very solid in coverage as a safety with the, the Jets. Yeah, with the Jets. Sorry. With the Buffalo Bills. Sorry, I am a mess. Guys, I need to make you guys aware of the Andre Branch Pyramid Scheme. I don't know if you remember this, but the year was 2016. The Miami Dolphins signed a defensive end. His name was Andre Branch. He came in here and he was an absolute stud. He set the tone. The Dolphins awarded his success with a three-year contract. He made it through one year of that contract. That is when the Andre Branch pyramid screen sorry josh that was when the andre branch pyramid scream was born emmanuel ogba also followed it so i just want to make you guys aware that shaq barry two-time super bowl oh my god josh you're gonna have to you're gonna have a couple minutes here i'm sorry penis i don't even know where the penis i'm just falling apart i wrote it down i wrote it down so easy to go in there and cut this shit out. Don't ever feel bad. So we had Andre Branch here for Jesus Christ. I don't even know how I want to talk about this because I don't have all the info. So I'm going to just dump all that, Josh. I'm just going to say. So the final player we have to talk about today does also not impact the compensatory pick formula. That is Shaq Barrett, who is signing with the Miami Dolphins on a one-year $9 million deal. Merrick, we were kind of upset to see someone like Andrew Van Ginkle go to Minnesota. You consider Jalen Phillips. He might not be ready for the start of the year. Bradley Chubb, he not he might not be ready for the start of the year. Instead, instead of AVG, that experienced vet, how do you feel about Shaq Barrett coming in? I once again like this signing, and I think this kind of gives you my overall take on this free agency period so far. A lot of Dolphins fans out there are mad. We lost Christian Wilkins. We lost Andrew Van Ginkle. We lost Robert Hunt. I'm not that upset. These guys got paid absurd amounts of money. Yeah, they were good players, but what did the Dolphins win with these players? Did they win a Super Bowl? No. Did they win a playoff game? No. Did they even win the AFC East a single time with Christian Wilkins on the roster? No, they didn't. So you bring in a guy like Shaq Barrett, one year, $9 million. He's not your edge defender of the future. You have those guys. You have Jalen Phillips. You have Bradley Chubb. You bring in a guy like Shaq Barrett. He's a stopgap. He gets you through the start of the season if these guys aren't ready. And I don't know if you guys saw... Instagram today, Jalen Phillips is looking real good. I'm going to plant my flag right now and say that Jalen Phillips will be playing week one for the Miami Dolphins. I don't think he's missing any time. Now, is he going to be 100%? No. And that's where a guy like Shaq Barrett comes in. He is a veteran in this league. He's won a lot in this league. He has put up numbers in this league. And now he plays for the Miami Dolphins. So very similar to the Melvin Ingram signing a couple years ago where, yeah, is he past his prime? Of course he's past his prime. But he can still contribute, and after you get through those first few weeks without possibly Jalen Phillips, but more likely without Bradley Chubb, as his injury was a little bit later in the year, after you get through that, he turns into ro a rotational guy. He's able to save himself for hopefully some, some playoff football, and, and 
I just like it. I think he's a good player. He's a heady player. And and I'm a fan of the one-year $9 million deal. Up to $9 million. It's not even a guaranteed $9 million. He, he might not even get that. But uh, but I, I think that's a, a darn good signing for the Miami Dolphins. And he's a great replacement for Andrew Van Ginkle. Yeah, I'm with you. I feel like it's just, you know, that next evolution almost, you know, if this is Pokemon, the next evolution of a Melvin Ingram. He's a little bit younger, can do a little bit more stuff. I think, what, 59 total sacks throughout his career. Everyone likes to gush about the Super Bowl he's used once. So um, when you have uncertainty with Jalen Phillips, uh, Bradley Chubb heading into the year, um, they had to do something. Um, so, yeah, I'm fine with it. Just another veteran to come in there and compete. So um, we'll see it all comes together, right? I mean, that's what we're all doing here now and the fact that we so many people are upset that the Dolphins lost these guys I mean like you mentioned they got paid absolutely absurd amount of money and we should have all been preparing for a lot of these guys to leave I know I was I know we came on here all the time and deep down inside we knew we weren't gonna retain a lot of these guys so it is what it is and now we're on to greener pastures or something like that Something like that, Josh. We'll say that for sure. So the NFL posted a clip of Christian Wilkins, uh, not to be a hater, but like that that's kind of the thing. Like it was great. And, and Christian Wilkins totally adds a strong foundation that really makes your defense. It's going to be good every year. And then what you do from there is up to you. But I mean, I think of the six highlights, five of them again were against teams with a losing record, including the Panthers, the Jets, and the, the Patriots. And then the one clip was against Josh Allen, who I think um, has some of the most turn work turnover worthy plays in all of football not trying to be a hater with that but you think about it christian wilkins is about to make 28 million dollars per year uh shaq barrett 9 million jordan brooks 9 million jordan poyer 2 million the dolphins added some defensive tackle depth in isaiah mack and davion nixon 1 million dollars a piece there like think about how hard it would have been for the dolphins to do truly anything if you're trying to sign christian wilkins to a number that's remotely close to that yep, uh, yep. it's been a wild wild first few days of free agency i think it's interesting that robert hunt is going to the panthers uh, it, it does seem like they're kind of following in the footsteps of if this worked for two uh, a shorter quarterback let's try to get big bob hunt over here it's upsetting to see someone like him go but you get it you understand that the dolphins are trying to make all these little moves and it's easy to get excited about them, right? It's super easy to get excited about the Shaq Barrett's, the Poyers, whoever it may be. But Merrick, where does this team have to go next? I'm still looking at that offensive line. You know, they signed a center. We've talked about how Connor Williams might be available after June June 1st when we get that Xavier Howard boost, possibly the, the Tua extension boost. You could be looking at upwards of $30 million coming to this team late summer. So then you look at a guy coming off the ACL and Connor Williams and you say, are you ready to come back? I know there were some rumors about Connor Williams possibly retiring on Twitter over the last 24 hours. I think those were... Game I think those were kind of yeah. I think those were fueled by some some crazy Dolphins fans on Twitter. I, I don't think Connor Williams is actually retiring. Not when you know you have millions of more dollars to make in your career when you're still a young guy. So could Connor Williams come back and play guard for the Dolphins? We talked about that earlier this episode. Yeah, I could absolutely see that. A guy I would like the Dolphins to take a look at and he wouldn't hurt the compensatory formula would be Lakin Tomlinson, uh, formerly of the Jets, but prior to that formerly of the San Francisco 49ers, played there when Mike McDaniel coached there, and Lakin Tomlinson had his best years in the outside zone, Shanahan-style rushing system. So he was kind of a bust for the Jets, but maybe because of that, you can get him on a cheaper deal. He doesn't affect the compensatory formula, and he could round back into form in a scheme that better suits his skill set. So my next signing, if I'm the GM, is Lake and Tomlinson. I'm bringing him in, in to play guard. And then that kind of fills up another need for this team, which allows them to go best player available at 21 overall in the draft next month. Yeah, I'd be all for that. I mean, we know what the Dolphins are doing, that offensive line. Um, do you want me to throw mine out there, Jake? Am I allowed to, am I allowed to go? Or did you want to talk about the offensive line at all? I'll allow it. No. <laughs> You'll out. Okay. So I, I was originally gonna come on here and I was gonna joke that they should trade for Justin Fields. Um, so let's let people boo me and all that right now. Trade yes, for Justin Fields, yes. bringing that back up quarterback. Yeah. Um, but really they need to find another cornerback, right? Opposite of Jalen Ramsey. I mean, we'd hope that Cam Smith can fill in there. Um, we've seen Cater Kohu play on the boundaries, we've seen Nick Needham play on the boundaries, but I think both those guys are almost better suited um inside. So for me, I find a cornerback. I mentioned Rocky Asin, a younger player. Um, well, he's not younger anymore, he's 28 years old. He played for Baltimore. Maybe there's some familiarity there. Uh, Kendall Fuller's a name, Christian Fulton. 
a Dory Jackson. I don't really have a specific cornerback in mind, but let's be honest, opposite of <laughs> Jalen Ramsey. We need another body. So um, I did see, I don't know if you guys saw, but someone posted an Eli Apple, like uh, it was one of those fake Ooh. accounts. And dude, <laughs> oh, oh it was you, Jake. Dude, that's how bad it is. Yeah. And I came on two hours later and you posted that. And I, dude, I, I shit my pants. I thought it was real. And you even <laughs> said like, I, you even said like, it almost got me. And I just did not understand what you were talking. About. I was still reading this tweet. Over and over again, I'm like, they did not give Eli Apple that much money, so they need a <laughs> so, quarterback. <laughs> so it was Adarn Schefter, basically, and uh, it was one of the fake tweets as you're just scrolling, and somehow there's always one that catches your eye. Maybe it's because they just use a specific picture, whatever it may be, but it was just that the Dolphins and Eli Apple agreed to like a four-year, $55 million deal, <laughs> and I don't know why, but for like half a second, I believed it, and I was just like, oh, good grief. Like, I this I, I need to take a breather just to kind of try to react about, to this. I only believe that because... I only believe it because you posted it. Like I would have never believed that if I was scrolling, but you posted. And I was like, "Oh, f-. like how, why would they do that?" Like because Chris Greer on the- that was Super about to be scary, dude. that was about to be Josh's thirteenth reason. So the Dolphins have just a handful of cornerbacks on the roster. How dare you not mention Ethan Bonner, who's going to step up and be an absolute stud for this unit? Someone uh, calls him White, White Mamba. They call him yes. White Mamba. <laughs> that's that's lovely. Uh, the Dolphins currently only have, uh, I think it's three guards under center, Liam Eichenberg, Lester Cotton, and, and Robert Jones. Are we sure that Aaron Brewer uh, is going to be someone who, are we Are we locking him into center? Are we sure there, there's zero chance he could be going sliding back to guard? I like him at center because of the pass protection issues. So mm-hmm. if you can maximize the skill set at center and, and minimize uh, you know, his pass blocking responsibilities. Cause he'll usually get help from a guard there. Um, I, I prefer him at center. They have two defensive tackles with a base salary of $1.1 million and Zach Sealer and Isaiah Mack. But outside of that, they, they need some more depth at defensive tackle. Um, they need another safety guys. How long do you think we're going to go before the Dolphins sign another wide receiver? There are, I think it was uh, Barry Jacks of the Miami Herald who came out and said that they are talking with Braxton Barrios about bringing him back, but do you think they are going to push in the chips to try to bring in another receiving threat? Well, I mean, there's still a lot of interesting names out there. I look at the draft. When I look at wide receivers, I look at the draft and how many years in a row have we heard that, Oh, this is one of the greatest wide receiver crops out there, you know, in, in draft history. It seems like every single year we're getting just the, the, the next evolution of NFL wide receiver. You, you got fast guys, you got big guys, you got guys with great hands. You got guys with great rack ability. You know what I mean? So like, I'm not paying big money to a a, a veteran wide receiver unless it's a wide receiver that's familiar with the system and can can kind of get up to speed a little bit quicker because we do realize how intricate the McDaniel system is. We're still waiting for Eric Azucama to 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 make an impact. Obviously, he had the neck injury last year. People were expecting big things for him. Could Ezukama come back and be that wide receiver three? Maybe the Dolphins aren't worried about it because they look at somebody like Ezukama and they say he's going to fill these shoes. But for me personally, I like wide receiver in this draft, and there is just a slew of names out there that make a whole lot of sense. You got Roman Wilson uh, from Michigan, who who uh, is a winner, a leader, and a great blocking wide receiver, which we all know is, is something that Mike McDaniel craves for this system. I personally like some of these bigger body guys because I think that's an, a missing element on this Dolphins offense, that, that red zone guy, that big body guy that can go up there and get those 50-50 balls. Somebody like an Xavier Leggett from, from South Carolina, um, which, by the way, I, I sent you guys this in the DMs, but I heard an interview of his today, and his his voice is amazing. He's got the southern most thing. most yeah. I love a good southern draw, man. And uh, he's got that like in spades. So give me somebody like that. There, there's just so many receivers that can be can be found in this draft that I'm not paying big money to to get one of these guys because even in the later rounds, you're seeing receivers taken in the fifth and sixth round that make an impact for their teams in the future. So Dolphins have a, a couple six round picks they could use. They have a fifth round pick they could use. I'm staying away from the free agent receivers. Like I said, unless it's somebody that knows the system well and can contribute early. And instead I'm going to invest some draft capital into a wide receiver three in the draft. The Dolphins have a clear one A and one B Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill. I don't see there being any way they invest some sort of high draft pick, uh, any sort of 
big chunk of change into that number three wide receiver position. If they do try to invest in one more uh, piece for this offense, I think it'd be a, another playmaker at tight end, but they do have that foundation signing Johnny Smith, or it'd be another running back despite already signing the seven that have seemed to be here forever. So that will be an interesting develop to see where the Dolphins decide to go next. But that is it. That is all the time we have today on another Dolphins podcast. Joshua Houts' internet kicked out near the end, so he totally disappeared. We're going to have to CGI him later. Thank you all so much for joining us. We will talk to you soon, and until next time, fins up. Fins up, baby.